First of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee on giving me this opportunity to present to you uh, over the internet uh, on this lecture on EOS guided bilirubin JNH indications, technique, and outcomes. Um, quite disappointingly, I couldn't join you guys uh, live in Dusseldorf. Uh, it's definitely a city that I would very much love to um, visit. But hopefully someday in the future, as the vaccines come by, we can uh, meet personally very soon. So these are my disclosures. Uh, before I talk about, about my talk, uh, I'd just like to give you some background. Um, this is the hospital I'm working in right now. It's a 1,500 bed uh, unit. Uh, we are building a new block now and planning to expand to 3,000 beds uh, within 10 years time. Uh, this is my boss, James, uh, as all of you uh, would know, and he's much better known for his work in uh, GI bleeding. Um, we have moved into this endoscopy unit uh, around uh, one or one and a half years ago. It's a nice room with a capability of both endo x-ray as well as US um, uh, all uh, being seen on the same huge 52 inch screen uh, not a module, so it's uh, very ergonomically friendly. And uh, in the central room, we can see both sides, so both uh, we can have a simultaneous x ray procedures uh, done uh, whilst uh, all of us can uh, monitor in the central, in the central room. So, um, in terms of US guided procedures, uh, when I first started learning these procedures, uh, one of my predecessors have warned me or gave me a, a tip. Uh, he said, uh, when you succeed in performing these interventions, you become a hero because you are performing almost the impossible. So, so many people have failed this procedure, but you've succeeded. But uh, these procedures, when you fail, you can fail miserably. So I also uh, wondered why um, my uh, predecessor told me about this uh, advice until I started running into my own issues. So this is a patient with a migrated uh, hepatogastrostomy into the peritoneal cavity. You can see the stand right there. The patient had to uh, suffer, the patient was suffering from unresectable uh, pancreatic cancer, uh, but still had to undergo this uh, procedure to salvage the, uh, the migrated stent. This is the hole in the stomach and this is the hole in the liver. And um, this is the situation you really want to uh, avoid. So why are US pro interventional procedures so difficult or potentially hazardous? Uh, I think uh, there are several reasons. First, uh, when we started doing these procedures, there are not many of these procedures. There's definitely lack of training. Um, we are often um, borrowing devices from ERCP and we do not have dedicated devices for doing these US interventions. And thirdly, um, when we um, um, fail in some sort of uh, US intervention procedures, it's often difficult to salvage the mishaps. For example, in the migrated stent, it's difficult to salvage. So these are the reasons combining together um, the difficulty experienced on uh, US guided interventions. So as Arnold Schwarzenegger has told us, failure is not an option and everyone has to succeed. And that is one of my mortals. Um, the other thing about US bleed drainage is different people, uh, different endoscopists have uh, different takes. Uh, if you look at this commentary by Cheyenne, um, amongst 500 ERCPs with native papilla, US guided bilirubin drainage was only required in 0.6% of ERCPs. Uh, and uh, this uh, editorial, he mentioned US guided bilirubin drainage is taxing and not ready. But in the same year, uh, by Moeen Kishab, he also wrote US guided bilirubin drainage. It is is it pretty ready for prime time? Definitely yes. So. Definitely for different endoscopists, they have different threshold for performing these procedures and uh, they, they can feel very differently about these procedures. But for me, I try to take a more objective approach. 
I want to look at the future of USPD and how we can continue to develop uh, this sort of procedure. So definitely we need to look at several things. One is indications. Two is the availability of um, a dedicated device. And three is definitely how we can improve the safety of performing these procedures. Currently the indications of USBD is mainly in patients with failed ERCP. So either failed deep cannulation in benign condition due to a tortuous common channel or in malignant uh, conditions where it can be due to a tumor obstruction or in patients with uh, inaccessible papilla, which may be due to altered GI anatomy, uh, malignant duodenal obstruction or prior duodenal metallic stenting. So these situations do not uh, come around very often. So as a result, the indication of frequency of USBD is not that high in most units. There are also several issues that we need to consider when performing USBD. Uh, one is to how, we, how can we achieve uh, drainage? So this can be done either transpapillary, which can be either a rendezvous uh, US ERCP or a US integrate stenting versus uh, transmural um, uh, drainage, which can be either a cholodocogenostomy or a hepatogastrostomy or a cholodocogastrostomy. And definitely the things we need to think about include uh, the etiology, etiology whether, whether it's benign or malignant, uh, whether the papilla is accessible, and also uh, uh, outcomes associated with these procedures, particular to the endoscopist himself, or himself or herself, because uh, with different experience, definitely the adverse events rate would be very different. We have, we have seen many publications comparing USBD versus PTPD. Uh, basically, most of these publications uh, are, are saying that USBD is better in terms of better clinical success rate, reduce adverse events, and also reduce intervention rates. And uh, many of these publications are suggesting USBD drainage should be preferred over PTPD. But uh, one thing uh, we need to be uh, uh, wary about is that most of these publications are from very expert centers with very experienced uh, endoscopists. So whether the results can be re repro reproduced by all endos end endosonographers, uh, we need to be careful about this point. Furthermore, there are some uh, talks about uh, expanding the indication of USBD drainage. And one of the hottest topic is whether USBD can be used to replace ERCP. Um, definitely this uh, uh, amazes a lot of people. Uh, it also amazed James when I talked to him about him, this sort of uh, idea. But if you look into the main rationale is that um, to perform a USBD drainage, we are avoiding placing a metal stand across the tumor. So potentially we may have a prolonged stand patency, uh, reduced procedural time, no risk of pancreatitis. Of course, we need technical expertise. Uh, there may be a small margin of safety and also risk of adverse events and most importantly, expensive procedure. So can we find enough uh, data to, so to support USBD over uh, years uh, uh, of uh, primary ERCP for drainage of malignant uh, obstruction. In the past few years, uh, there are several uh, studies comparing uh, these two procedures uh, for primary biliary drainage, drainage in malignant uh, biliary obstruction. So this study from um, Korea, uh, only small number of patients comparing CDS versus ERCP, no difference in stem patency in AE. This other study, again, a small study uh, by Cheyenne, uh, US CDS with um, a viable stent versus ERCP, again, no difference in dysfunction, uh, stent dysfunction. So both of these studies uh, suffer from a type one error with inadequate sample size. And only recently from uh, this study in Korea, uh, including four to three centers um, um, that compared US HGS versus or CDS versus ERCP. Um, they demonstrated a very um, excellent result of USBD over adverse events rate is 6.3% versus 19.7%. There were no patients with pancreatitis 
Re-intervention rate was 15% versus 42%. And SAM patency was significantly higher with US uh, BD, 63% versus 36%. And this is the Kaplan-Meier curve. So uh, on first glance, uh, this study was uh, very excellent uh, and showing a quite a maybe a very overwhelming uh, uh, advantage of the USBDR. But for me, I think the stamp patency is a little bit low for the ERCP arm, uh, particularly in one year, stamp patency rate of around 40% is probably uh, one of the lower, um, uh, lower reporting stamp patency rates I've seen in randomized trials. So uh, we are also performing uh, a randomized trial looking at the performance of USCDS with a hot axial six to eight millimeters versus primary RCP. Uh, we have submitted the abstract to DDW this year and we look forward to sharing you the uh, outcomes of this exciting study. Uh, on the other hand, apart from expanding indications, we also need to look at how we can improve the safety of USBD. For me, I think this can be done by several ways. One is to standardize the procedure. Two is to have dedicated device and three to have uh, adequate training, uh, not only in patients, but also in terms of models and training courses. For new devices, um, we have seen the development of uh, many US specific stents uh, these few years. Uh, all, of us, all of us are very uh, familiar with axios as well as spexes. For the tubeless type of stand, I think the GeoBall stand is more popular, but uh, Axios is also coming out with their own version of the HGS, and there are also several Korean stands being available. So these US specific stands are very important because um, they allow a uh, much easier delivery uh, of the stand and also a single step deployment. So this is uh, one of the latest uh, development. This is a hot spexes. Um, I was performing the, uh, a gallbladder drainage with the hot spexes stent. The hot spexes has a cartridge tip, much like the axial stent. And we can burn into the gallbladder quite easily, right there. Um, and then a guy wire can be inserted into the gallbladder. Uh, stand deployment is uh, by um, the assistant, so it's much like the original uh, battery stands. And um, after deployment, you can see a uh, stand being placed in a very nice position. And a lot of turbid bar being drained out. So with this um, dedicated device, um, the whole procedure becomes much more enjoyable and much more easier. And for me, I think for the no-voice um, uh, endoscopist, definitely a much uh, smaller chance of running into complications. So this is the uh, Novus uh, Axial 6 year stent. A part of it is uncovered and you have this uh, characteristic dumbbell-shaped design of the Axios. Another um, HGS stent, which is uh, by the Bonner stent Dias. Um, you can see uh, I was puncturing the uh, segment three ducts with a needle. This is followed by a guide wire. This patient had prior duodenal stent, so ERCP was not possible. So as, after passage of the guide wire, the special design of this stent is that there's a dilating tip, and then the stent has a uncovered uh, end anchoring the stent to the uh, liver edge and also flaps on the stomach side to prevent migration. So uh, after puncturing and gawa insertion, I, I can immediately insert this stent right there. And it goes in, in, into the uh, bowel duct very smoothly. It's an 8.5 French delivery system. So it's a very nice in negotiating the um, bowel duct. And afterwards, we just open the stent uh, as per usual, part of it under uh, fluoroscopy guidance, and then the remainder in, within the uh, endoscope channel. And then we will push out the stent into the stomach and, and then complete the hepatogastrostomy right there. So with this device, these devices uh, characteristic is all of these are single step delivery system. 
So we can reduce the number of um, um, stand exchanges uh, and potentially I think we can reduce the uh, adverse events rate as well as the learning curve because uh, it is much more easier to perform these procedures and uh, the procedures can be completed in a very short time period. So importance of these device, uh, again, is to reduce the difficulty of the procedure, reduce the risk of bar leak, shorten the procedural time, and also decrease the learning curve. And then in order to standardize this procedure, we have also recently uh, published um, the first consensus guideline on interventional years procedure by Asian US group. And biliary drainage is definitely one of the procedures that we have uh, looked uh, into very detailedly in this guideline. So anyone who are interested in uh, performing these procedures, I strongly encourage you to check out these guidelines. And finally, training. Um, as part of the Asian US group, we are always big on training. Um, definitely models is one of a very good way to uh, learn US drainage procedures. Uh, Vinay has published this very nice article uh, looking at the use of 3D printing in um, uh, um, designing a course for USB drainage. So definitely it helps a lot, particularly uh, in learning these basic steps in terms of uh, puncturing, insertion of guide wire, dilatation, and also stand insertion for uh, beginners. So in terms of adverse events, um, there are several things that can go wrong during these procedures like misdeployment, migration, blockade, perforation, foot impaction. For me as an endosonographer, we need to realize which sort of uh, adverse events we may, we may potentially, we can, we can deal with it ourselves and which sort of complications we may need help. So for me, uh, for the first five, most of these can be dealt with endoscopically. For the last uh, complication bleeding, uh, we may need a multidisciplinary involvement, uh, uh, including our radiologists as well as, as our surgeons. And when managing these uh, issues, um, we have to realize that um, now we have two problems to deal with. One is the first indication and the other is the complication. So you need to ask yourself whether you can deal with it, the issue yourself, whether you should complete with the procedure, whether the patient can tolerate another failure, is there someone else who could do a better job in the unit? And also whether you need to involve uh, other disciplines. But definitely if you have someone more experienced, uh, go find help. And uh, definitely you can learn a lot from uh, during these situations. This is a patient with a um, uh, migrated stand in the peritoneum. So after our first experience, this uh, we learned from our first experience. So um, we know that we can potentially uh, salvage this with uh, endoscopic uh, intervention. So first we, I close the opening with a OVESCO clip. There's an option to do a nodes procedure and go through the opening and try to fish out the stand. Uh, for me, I'm always a bit worried about nodes uh, because um, uh, there are a lot of uncertainties but after I closed the opening, I changed back to a linear scope. I was very um, lucky because I was able to see the stent opening. And once I was able to see the stent opening, then puncturing uh, was not a difficulty. Uh, I just need to push the needle out, change the angulation of my scope to better, to better um, uh, angulate into the stent. Then the guy wire was passed into the stent and reestablish the connection with the bow duct. And thereafter, uh, I just had to complete the procedure as per normal with a cystotome followed by stand insertion and then a stent on stent delivery of the uh, completed XGS. So I was able to salvage this procedure. The patient did stay for a bit longer in the hospital, but he was able to be discharged uh, uneventfully. So um, to further uh, expand the indications in USB drainage, we also need to think about um, some indications that we previously would not consider endoscopic interventions. So in this patient, uh, it's quite interesting, uh, pancreatic cancer with Whipple's operation, uh, adjuvant uh, uh, chemotherapy uh, given, 
uh, but noted to have a progressive disease, came in with uh, fever and also afrin limb obstruction. You can see in the CT, the small bowel, the afrin is very dilated. So in this situation, first, uh, we performed a US guided afrin limb drainage. This was done by the uh, ax hot axios. First, we punctured the uh, afferent limb with a needle. Followed by insertion of a guy wire. And then the axial stand being inserted into to, to the afferent limb. And once inside the afferent limb, we were able to deploy the axial stand right there. This is the flange already opened. And we pull back the stand and drain into the uh, remnant stomach. The patient then suffered from persistent obstruction. We noted the right duct was uh, still obstructed. So we decided uh, since the axial has drained the afferent limb, we can go to the hepatojejunostomy and use this at the axials as a way to access the XJ. And you can see it's very edematous uh, after our prolonged uh, attempt. Finally, we are able to cannulate um, the hepatogastrostomy. Uh, so one wire in one side, the other in the other. And finally, we are able to insert a bilateral uh, SEMS to complete the um, drainage. So a, a bilateral metal stent uh, to, to um, uh, drain the obstructed uh, hilum. So definitely a added indication uh, for ESBD apart from failed ERCP can also be an alternative to ER ERCP as well as a portal for bowel duct intervention. So for me, in the future, I think it also expands a lot of indications uh, in US biliary drainage. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I think we are in a period of very exciting period of boom in US biliary drainage. Um, we are challenging conventional indications and also opening new opportunities and raising new management issues. Um, the availability of novel devices will make the procedures easier and safer. And with adequate training, I think all of us can perform these procedures in a very safe and effective manner. So thank you for your attention.